I feel like that's more our vibe. You know what I don't love? What? Having the urge to sneeze in public. <laughs> Even though sneezing isn't one of the symptoms of COVID, I hate the urge of like, I got to sneeze, but I don't want the tension right now. <laughs> I'm not trying to bring that energy. <laughs> I don't like it. I don't uh, like being that guy. I hold in so many like coughs from like food I ate or something like that. It, Tears running down my face. It, it's become a thing. Uh, where everybody is now extremely cautious. Oh, yeah. Uh, you know, I had a sneeze the other day that I held to to the point where I think I might have hurt something internally. Most definitely. <laughs> You're suppressing a lot. Well, You're suppressing a lot. I am, a, I am suppressing a lot, but not just sneezes. And this is Freedonomics, folks. <laughs> <laughs> um, welcome to Freedonomics, where... Oh, Tim Dooner coming in hot already. Welcome to Freightonomics, <laughs> where we bring freight and economics together. I am Anthony Smith, and to my other side, because I'm not sure what orientation we have on this camera, <laughs> is Zach Strickland. I'm this direction. He's that direction, and <laughs> this is Freightonomics. I have a specialty in economics, and my buddy, compadre here. I have no specialty. Freight, that's a specialty. <laughs> he has a specialty, all right? He's been in the industry for quite a long time. And uh, we have a good amount of information to get through today. Yeah, we do. We have a good show. We've got Mr. Zach Rogers, uh, affectionately known as Zach Two, here, uh, coming on to talk to us about that logistics managers index. One um, of my favorites. And ho and we've got some interesting developments that are reminiscent of a 2018 pattern. So anybody that's been involved in the freight market for the last couple of years knows that 2018 was a very interesting. Uh, time period for freight movement, but we'll get into that here in a minute when, when we bring Zach on. But first up, Anthony Smith, uh, do you know what week it is? Oh, this is good. <laughs> it's a very frustrating week. I know that much. What week is it, Zach? Affectionately known as road check week. Ah, I'm sure drivers love that. So, yeah. So basically the safety administrations for the three North American entities, uh, Canada, Canada. If I'm pronouncing that right, I Mexico so. and the Un United States of America, all of the organizations get together and they basically do this big push of checking on trucks, class eight vehicles, making sure they're operating appropriately, but also compliant with all the regulations. And, you know, this year they've done it a little differently. Uh, they've decided to push it back, number one. Uh, it's traditionally scheduled for early June, but they've pushed this, at least the one aspect of it, which is the compliance factor, HOS, hours of service compliance factor. That's what they're focusing on this week as they check uh, logs and ELD op operations. Uh, and then they have this maintenance aspect to make sure that your vehicle is operating as safe as possible. And th this year, they always pick like a certain mechanic uh, mechanical piece to focus on, and this year it's going to be brakes, but that part is not happening until August. Okay. Uh, traditionally, you see a lot of drivers kind of come off the road or even just inflate rates because they can, because there's a higher risk of, you know, being pulled over, time delays, et cetera, that are happening this time of year. Uh, so they will, it will have an, you know, kind of a, I don't want to say minor influence to rates, mm -hmm. but it's definitely a factor. Uh, this year, People are probably not parking their trucks, <laughs> considering they're not going to get that maintenance uh, check that can potentially pull them off the road for weeks, if not sometimes a month or more, uh, if their truck is not in working order. Uh, but I do think that you will see still, we, we're seeing it a little bit, and I don't know if we can totally apply this to, uh, to the road check week, but tender rejection rates are going up a little yeah. bit. This is a weird time. It's hard to really isolate what's what's causing what uh, in the freight market. But yes, road check week this week. So in short, essentially, for the trucking layman out there, there is this week where there's a lot of attention on truck drivers driving throughout the country, and they are potentially at a higher risk for getting pulled over and ticketed with some type of violation. So. Some of them are just going to forego it altogether, just like, hey, not worth the risk. And then some are just going to say, hey, I'm taking the risk, but I'm going to charge a little bit more. Yep. Is this going to impact? So, you, yeah, you said it's going to impact capacity. It's going to be like a potential capacity crunch, right? Somewhat, it's not going to be. It, I, I don't think that it's going to have a big impact to capacity. Uh, I don't think you're going to see, like last year, for instance, it was a big deal. Okay. Because rates were very suppressed, historically down year over year. Uh, a lot of trucks were struggling anyway. A lot of drivers were struggling any, anyway. 
uh, with just covering costs of operation. So taking that chance to be on the road when you could actually be putting yourself out of commission for a period of time, losing business, et cetera, uh, just isn't worth your time. This year, a little different situation. We've come out of a very quiet April and May only to be awakened abruptly in June and July uh, with volumes, you know, really pushing through record levels at this point um, through a lot of industries uh, out there. So I don't think it's worth their time to shut down like they did in 2019, but I still think that we, we probably will see some level of influence to the spot market and rates to an extent. I yeah. don't think capacity is going to have a big, a big impact. Gotcha. Gotcha. But we'll see. Good to know. Yeah, I mean, we don't know anything until, like, you know, it happens because it's been a crazy year, crazy yeah. happenings happening around the world. Yes. And I forgot to mention, we're streaming live oh. right now. So we're on LinkedIn and we're on Facebook. And if you want to jump in on the conversation, because especially we're going to have a brilliant man on here <laughs> soon and ask some questions uh, regarding the LMI or some of the trends that we're seeing in the Logistics Managers Index. Is that a screen pop up right now? There's it a screen sure pop up. All right. Sure is. All right. So, there's <laughs> <laughs> but if you want to get in there and um, have your voice heard, feel free to jump into the comments, and we'll get right at you. Yeah. So. Let us know what you're what you're seeing out there this week. Uh, if you if you're on the road, or obviously you're in the middle of driving right now, do not do that while you're driving. <laughs> yeah, that, that's, <laughs> that's yeah, Zach, you're that's a bad not, influence. That's that's what we're trying to avoid with uh, Safety Week. Right. Um, so before we get to Zach, one quick story of the day, Anthony, yes. that I think is worth uh, mentioning because we do cover all aspects of, this, of the supply chain on Freightonomics. Uh, and one of those aspects is, you know, what's happening internationally? Uh, you know, we bring in a lot of freight into this country, roughly a third of it by some estimates, uh, you know, get brought into the country on a ship and then transfer to freight. It's part of the supply chain. One of the things that, uh, you know, brilliant editor uh, Kim Link Wills writes. Did the full name. Yeah. <laughs> uh, she covers the American shipper stuff. Uh, does I mean, this is a fantastic group of people. They've been in the industry for a long time uh, now, uh, covering all sorts of maritime and international trade aspect of, of the supply chain. And they're talking about how the ports have had this big push. The Los Angeles, you know, California ports basically saying, hey, we need to do something about reverse, uh, reversing the decline of the market share that the Los Angeles Long Beach ports are seeing right now. And there's, you know, yeah, that's easy. That's easy to say. Yeah. You know, but there's all sorts of factors going on with this. I mean, not making it political here, but it is a political situation. Yeah. Uh, but California, of course, has environmental regulations. Uh, there's labor union uh, discrepant or dif differences between the East and West Coasts. Um, there's canal expansion that has occurred, the Panama Canal, of course, now larger. We've got large amounts of private investment going into, uh, you know, the like ports of Savannah. Some of the Gulf Coast ports have made expansions. Uh, but New York, New Jersey has uh, taken the majority of that market share. And that's not simple. That's, you know, all those things that I just stated are factors. Right. But the biggest thing that we talked about last year was the fact that a lot of these shippers that are bringing their freight in are shipping from other countries now, where now coming to the East Coast is a little bit better s solution for them yeah. in terms of transit times and also cost. So, again, they can say all these things that they want. I mean, and there's the uh, last time I checked, the ports of Long Los Angeles and Long Beach were about as big as they could possibly be. There are obviously a lot of improvements they can make in terms of making it easier for people to get in and out of, you know, making some improvements obviously there, but that's lots of money. Yeah. Um, and again, they were recently uh, bought out by the United States government. So, or they were forced out of, they, we basically bought out China. <laughs> Imagine that. <laughs> Jeez. Well, I mean, when I'm hearing this, it's just like, of course, I, not getting any kind of political situation, but I, I, I'm not a fan of regulation. I'm and it either. sounds like neither are a lot of these other individuals that are shipping through that area. And so they're going to something that's not as regulated, a little bit easier, free flowing to mm -hmm. operate. And I think this can be applied to many other aspects of just business. When you implement certain regulations time over time, 
it's not going to have the intended effects and it's going to be unintended consequences as a, as an aftermath. And so I think you can apply it here. You can see it real time here and you can see it real time happening in other mm -hmm. industries outside of freight and transportation, but here specifically. Yeah. Well, funny thing about it too, is that when times get desperate, people just go back to their old ways. And right now, instead of being very selective in what port they're, they're targeting, they're just, br the shippers are bringing stuff right back into the port of Los Angeles and Long Beach again. Starting this month, we've actually seen some year over year increases. Uh, for the first time in a while, end of June, uh, early July, we've actually seen a big surge of imports coming into Los Angeles, both those ports uh, compared to previous months. Again, they've already been recovering, but it's still been down year over year. Yeah. Um, for the most part, except for April, we had a huge surge <laughs> of right. stuff come in again, bottlenecks, uh, and all that. But again, you, you, I think to your point, you want to encourage as much activity in your business unit as possible. And yeah. you don't do that with regulations more, more, more often than not. Yeah. Um, and, cause it just makes things more difficult. Makes you want things to, a lot more difficult. In my mind, you incentivize people. You don't, exactly. you don't tell them no. It's like with yeah. my kids. You know, I try to make it as easy as possible for them to do the right thing while not being over-reliant on saying, stop doing that bad thing mm. in an aggressive tone. Words of wisdom. <laughs> Parenting. <laughs> Parenting. By Zach Strickland, yeah. folks. Well, let's get on with, uh, let's bring on our boy and, uh, and talk Zach some LMI. Too? Yeah, because there's a lot of interesting stuff happening in the LMI. Um, I was able to catch up with Zach Rogers, Dr. Zach Rogers, not too long ago. And yeah, we're excited to have him on. He's here. He's not, well, not here in the <laughs> office, but he's here on uh, this podcast. And Zach Rogers, thanks for joining us. Hey, guys. Yeah, live from quarantine. I'm happy to be, be calling in. And you know what I do, Anthony, when I have to sneeze? I just loudly yell, oh, allergies. And that co sort of calms people down because <laughs> they think, oh, he doesn't have coronavirus. I don't think people are believing it. <laughs> I don't think anyone's believing it. They're just uh, like, yeah, okay, guy, allergies. Actually, and, it, and like I said, it's not even like a symptom, right? Isn't yeah. sneezing? It's more coughing, right? I don't well, know. Yeah. I actually lean into it now uh, just because it, it keeps the social distancing uh, better. Yeah. You know, you sneeze and then you just throw a couple extra coughs out there just to make sure that everybody hears you. Yeah, I'm, ass I'm assuming everything's a symptom at this point, though. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. That's what I'm assuming. So, Zach, welcome uh, back. And, you know, at some point when all this is over, we're definitely going to have you out here. Uh, Oh, for yeah. real, some real time, real time QT uh, with the Freightonomics guys. But, um, you know, we just had a June release of the Logistics Managers Index, did we not? Yes. Yep. Came out uh, uh, first Tuesday of every month. So last mm -hmm. week uh, it came out and we saw some growth uh, this month. Now, you need to cut the pieces of the LMI apart to understand where that growth is coming from. <laughs> but luckily, we're here to do that. Um, and, but so we, we were up to 61.7 for the overall index in June. Now, just so everybody remembers, any number above 50 indicates growth. Any number below 50 uh, indicates contraction. And how far or how far uh, above or below 50 they are indicates sort of the magnitude of growth or contraction. So we're at 61 in June, which is up 10 points from April. OK, when we were at 51 and, and April was sort of the nadir, the lowest we had seen. And now we're seeing in the 60s in June. So that indicates growth in the logistics industry. Uh, but you need to really break the pieces apart to understand why that's happening. And really what this is, is uh, it's a story of, of inventory in many ways. And so we have huge inventory growth across uh, all sort of levels of the supply chain. And this is happening for two reasons. One, we have the inventory we brought in, you know, before we knew the shutdown was going to happen and then couldn't sell. But really last, last month, what we saw was on top of all that, that baseline of a lot of inventory that a lot of companies had, now we have these reopenings happening. And so then we have more inventory come, come on top of it. And so where we really see more inventory last month is downstream. So retailers, consumer facing companies. And what this does is you look at a metric like warehouse capacity utilization. Okay, so how much of the available warehouse space we have are we utilizing? In May, our downstream retailers were at a 48, so contraction. So they were actually using less warehouse space in May than they did in April. 
In June, that jumps up to 67. So it's an 18, 19 point swing from May to June for downstream. So retailers, consumer facing companies utilizing warehouse space. And so now our warehouses are starting to get a lot more crowded. And if you look at our overall number, our available warehouse capacity, it was a 41. The lowest it's been in the four years that we've been doing the LMI. And so basically what we're seeing is inventory is going up so quickly that we have less warehouse space now uh, than we've pretty much ever had uh, in the four years uh, that we've been doing this. And so space is getting gobbled up really quickly. Obviously, that's driving costs way up, um, both for warehouses and inventory, just holding costs in general. And it's leading to, I think, some pretty interesting uh, things, specifically where people are turning to to supplement warehouse space storage. And so one of the things, and, and I'm sure you guys have been talking about it a little this, uh, this week and maybe last week, too, uh, companies are utilizing intermodal containers as sort of a supplement to warehousing. Okay, so if you look at like, you know, the rail stuff, right? Somehow intermodal is suddenly ahead of car load. Okay, I, I went back for a couple of years. That, that's, it's the first time it's happened in quite a while that we've had more intermodal traffic than car load traffic. Well, why is that? It's because companies, okay, we, we can't find any warehouse space. The warehouse is, you know, it's at a 41. So the warehouse space that's left is either suboptimal, and, and, and expensive, it, it's like not the good stuff and it's gonna cost us more. And so we're seeing the shift towards, well, let's just slow roll it on a train. We'll put it on intermodal containers. And so we're seeing freight rates go up, right? I was gonna bring this back to freight for you guys eventually. We're seeing freight rates go up and container usage go up because of all of this inventory being stored in the warehouses. Yeah, so yeah. I think this is a this is a fascinating uh, thing to watch for me specifically, I guess. But um, the fact that we're, you know, it's kind of like we were listening to the, you know, we're watching the tankers, uh, you know, with the oil mm -hmm. glut back in April. It's a similar impact. Yeah. And and something we kind of suspected was happening was this idea that we saw we were seeing a bunch of warehouse repositioning, uh, you know, especially in like April and May. Uh, when we were, we weren't really sure that demand had fully recovered from, you know, what we were looking at, you know, and that everybody was shut down period uh, of time with, a, you know, all the COVID uh, shutdown. But I'm not really, you know, something that's fascinating to me is the fact that we are still seeing increasing inventory levels at the same time yeah. that we're seeing increasing transportation utilization and subsequently freight rates. That to me is fascinating. Right. Normally they, they move in, uh, they, they diverge from each other uh, because as inventory levels get drawn down, uh, transportation gets higher. This appears to be one of those situations where they're simply pushing freight from one warehouse to another. Is that, does that sound reasonable? Yeah, yep. There's a lot of repositioning uh, in the network. So we're shifting inventory around, uh, around our own networks. Some of it, maybe we're pushing back upwards in the supply chain back towards our, our suppliers or, or mm -hmm. you know, the manufacturers if possible. And then other things we're just kind of driving around because we don't have anywhere for them to be, basically. So we, we sort of have a, a, an increase in pipeline inventory that's really neither neither here or, or, or there, right? It's like when you you know you don't have any room left in your uh, it may be in your closet. And so you just have that sort of you know, laundry basket of shirts. It's always just sort of like, okay, this is sort of the intermediate one. Maybe I've got some of my own. Uh, we sort of have this intermediate sort of stage where things are hanging out here because, yeah, I, well, I knew you, uh, but we don't have, we don't have the storage capacity uh, elsewhere. Zach, one of the things that you mentioned that I really found interesting was um, retailers, potentially so those downstream, really kind of being impacted the most by this uh, warehousing crunch. Do you think this is going to be exacerbated um, if we are looking towards um, more potential stores and businesses shutting down? Because it seems like a lot of this was in, uh, in to position themselves with more states opening back up, more businesses opening back up. Yep. If we start seeing more shutdowns, do you think this is going to like amplify that crunch that we're seeing right now? Oh, absolutely. Because you, because then you're, it's kind of a double shock. So we were building up, you know, inventories in the beginning of the year, then we got shut down, and then we start to open up again, 
And so we start building up more inventory and then maybe we shut down again. And so it's almost turning into a little bit of a W. Um, in fact, there's a store uh, right down the, the street from, from my office. Uh, they sell, I, so I teach Colorado State, they sell like, you know, hats and shirts and stuff, CSU stuff. And there was an article in the local paper last week and the guy was saying, well, you know, I haven't had anybody basically since March and I'm hoping that football comes back. So I just placed, because this is when we were starting to reopen, I just Amen. placed a big order for hats and I hope that football starts again. But if it doesn't, basically I'm going to go out of business because I just placed this big second order on top of the inventory I had already. Now I'm, I'm worried about businesses like that and retailers like that who could have this sort of double shop. Um, now, what do you do with that inventory? I mean, basically, what's going to happen is it, it. This is going to be uh, maybe, in some ways, the best year ever for liquidators, okay, and, and salvage dealers and, and places like that. I mean, so it'll go somewhere, uh, and maybe in a year for consumers, it'll be great because we'll just have all this sort of backlogged inventory. But uh, you're right, Anthony. I, I think that that downstream. Uh, you know, uh, downstream retailers, those are the ones who are going to get the most sort of pressure from both sides right now because of the massive amounts of inventory. So, Zach, you know, not all supply chains are created equal, nor is all demand. Uh, as we've learned here in the last couple of months, we're seeing certain yeah. products, you know, really see a spike in demand, food and beverage, for instance, right. back in, in March and, you know, toilet paper, uh, which is well documented, documented at this right. point. Uh, while others are seeing, you know, noted declines. And, and it, it's very, it's difficult to discern who's coming or going at this point. But, you know, something that, you know, sticks out to me is the fact that we still don't have like, you know, a large, like the numbers that I've seen still don't really suggest that we're seeing a total recovery of the demand side. Consumers are spending, but they're not spending at the levels that they were last year. Um, right. And I, you know, I'm just curious to know if, you know, but again, at the same time, you go to Amazon uh, or, or somebody or some other, you know, furniture distributor uh, and you and you talk to them. I've done this because I just I, I moved into a new house. So I'm speaking from experience. Um, they don't have the inventory available. And so I, I think, you know, explaining how maybe this could happen when we're talking about it, increasing inventory levels demand's not uh, still not all the way there yet what what exactly is going on here that we're seeing surging inventory levels capacities you know getting crunched again and yet i still can't get the stuff that i need within you know the same period of time that i got it last year what do you, what do you think's going on with all that right so it's it's pretty industry and and product uh dependent and so we do see an uptick like you said you just got a house there there's an uptick right now in people buying houses people buying cars furniture, big ticket stuff like that, because nobody's going on a trip this year. We've del you know, nobody, we didn't have to pay taxes until today, which is a reminder to listeners. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I just saw Anthony break into a sweat. Um, but, uh, you got to do that. No refund this uh, year, Anthony. <laughs> I'm a responsible bachelor. I got to do it tonight too. Oh, uh, <laughs> but, but so we've sort of pushed all these things back. And so we do see, you know, an uptick in some big ticket items like couches and, and things like that. Um, and basically it's, it depends on the retailer you're looking at. Um, you know, some electronic stores, if people aren't, people don't want to go back to those, but I need a cord or something. I'm just going to buy it online. And so it's really channel dependent. And yeah. it's interesting because a lot of companies have different distribution mechanisms for their brick and mortar and their online delivery, right? I mean, we talk about omni-channel, but not everybody's quite there yet. And so that's a lot, too, of what you're seeing with this freight movement. We're moving inventory potentially from our sort of more traditional face-to-face -face retail sort of chain into online fulfillment, okay? Because what a distribution center does and a fulfillment center does are very different, and a lot of companies try to keep those separate. Yeah, so, uh, you know, elaborate on that a little bit. I think that's a good point of clarification is what is the district what what's the difference between a distribution center and a fulfillment center oh sure okay so a distribution center that's sort of your traditional warehouse and mostly what you're doing in a distribution center is you're acting as a waypoint between the manufacturer and the retailer okay so think of like a wholesaler that they, they run distribution centers okay we get a big pallet of 
shoes or something. And then we're going to send out cases of shoes to Foot Locker or, uh, you know, Champs or Dicks or, or, or whatever it's going to be. A fulfillment center is direct to consumer. So whereas a, a distribution center, all they do is B2B. Fulfillment centers do B2C. And so when you think like an Amazon, that's a fulfillment center. So we're just shipping out one pair of shoes or a box with four or five different things on it. And so the operation uh, in a fulfillment center tends to be a little more intensive than a distribution center. And it's a very sort of different system a lot of times these flow through. And so if you're a company with an omni-channel, right, my distribution center is, is how I move goods to my stores. My fulfillment center is how I move goods to individual consumers. And so because those are different operations, it becomes difficult sometimes and expensive to, to do you know, both fulfillment and distribution out of the same hub. Or even if it's in the same building, maybe they're on different sides uh, of the warehouse or something like that. And so, um, and, and so because of that, we're moving away probably from more distribution into more fulfillment. And so that could be one of the reasons why we're not seeing, even though we have all this inventory in the system somewhere, it's hard for us to get it directly to the consumer. Yeah. And which is why we're seeing an increase of final mile distribution and things like that, where they, you do get, get some of these big ticket items going through fulfillment centers right. versus the distribution center into a retail brick and mortar. Right. Um, so one quick question before we're, we're running up on time, and I want to make sure that we get to this. So I, I go through the LMI every month, obviously, uh, with Anthony in detail. Uh, but we, uh, you know, something that I noticed this month was very interesting to me in the way that I pull up transportation capacity in our sonar platform. Uh, and I look at the chart, compare that to inventory levels. And in the last month, we see inventory levels going up, transportation capacity coming down. Uh, yeah. And that's very reminiscent of another period of time in recent history, which I teased at the beginning of the show, of 2017, 2018's freight market. Yeah. And I'm just curious to know if you recall, you know, how is this similar? How is this different than that period of time to you? Because you were obviously involved in, in creating this data and, and going through it. Are there, are there any similarities? Because that was one of the tightest trucking markets in history. Just want to hear your take. So there's, there's some similarities. Now, it's, it's not the same magnitude. I don't think that delta between inventory levels and transportation capacity. So transportation capacity was like a 49 this month. That mm -hmm. essentially means break even. Uh, you know, I mean, it's, it's down a little bit, but essentially it's break even. Compare that to June of 2018, it was a 33. And the month after that is a 38. And so, yes, we're seeing tightness, but not tightness to the level that we saw in 2018, at least in terms of, of rate of change. Now, part of that is because we had record freight orders in September or October of 2018. Um, but, you know, we, we see more, you know, there was freight orders this month, right? We're building trucks this month. I mean, it's about, you know, trucking and warehousing is about the only industries right now where we're seeing big expansions, uh, both in terms of employment, in terms of capital investment and, and things like that. So there's similarities, uh, but the magnitude is not the same. The other thing I would say is that uh, the underlying fundamentals of what was going on in 2018 versus now are a little bit different. So in 2018, we had a hot consumer and hot manufacturing, right? Uh, upstream, we were, we, were, we were more robust. Right now, all the variance we're seeing is pretty much based on the consumer. Oh man, so and I got it's about if we're open or not. I got to jump in because we are running right up on time. Uh, Zach, thank you for all that. Um, this is a good stuff. This is yeah. fantastic stuff. Yeah, because that just reminded me, like, this was amazing for the downstream. But we there's still a whole other conversation yeah. to have about upstream and manufacturing. And <laughs> we got to have more. Episode. We got to have more, Zach. Thanks yeah. for showing up today. And thanks for your insight. Yeah, and thank you. Uh, thank everybody for watching. Nice. I don't we like spicy food. Trivia question this week? <laughs> yeah, we ran out. But uh, you're, 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 you're,